Thank you so much for joining us today. This is the oral abstract sessions for the sexual and gender minority presentations. Our first presentation is by Amit Gupta, who will be talking about LGV in British Columbia, changing epidemiology in the post prep era. Welcome Amit. Hi everybody, I'm gonna trust that everybody can see my slides well. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction and thank you for the car organizers for inviting me to present today. Uh, we actually managed to acquire a little bit more data for everybody today, so we're pleased to be presenting data from 2015 to 2021. I have no financial conflicts of interest to report. And just jumping into the presentation of what LGV is, well, LGV is, a, is an aggressive sexually transmitted infection caused by chlamydia trachomatis. Uh, infection usually starts with a painless ulcer at the site of inoculation, but this is often unnoticed in anorectal infections. And about two to six weeks later, infection spreads into regional lymph nodes, and that causes this, this, this inflammation and systemic symptoms with two main presentations of LGV being seen around the globe. So one, what we see more commonly in Canada in the MSM epidemic involves proctitis. So that's the inflammation of the rectum. And this is with, a, with or without a mucosal discharge. Uh, in the tropical areas of the world, we see a, a pretty different presentation with inguinal syndrome being more common. So that's pain and inflammation in the pubic areas. But suffice to say that both of these presentations can be quite severe. I also want to highlight that LGV does differ from traditional urogenital chlamydia. Uh, so one, it does differ genetically. So on the genetic level, LGV is caused by different genetic serovars compared to urogenital chlamydia, as well as the tissue targets can be quite different. So LGV gets more into the lymph tissue and that's what's getting those in that invasive that invasive disease that we just don't see with progenital chlamydia and historically lgv has been seen as an as a symptomatic infection that was usually quite severe um, whereas in contrast urogenital chlamydia is often asymptomatic I also want to highlight that the populations affected are very different. So with LGV, it's mainly affecting our MSM population, particularly those living with HIV in Canada, whereas urogenital chlamydia, the burden is still largely felt by young women. Before 2003, LGV was very rare in industrialized countries, including Canada. So most cases were being acquired during travel to endemic areas. But in 2003, this really started to change with these outbreaks that started happening in MSM living with HIV, starting in the Netherlands, but then moving into the rest of Europe and then the US and then Canada. And as a result of these outbreaks, there was enhanced surveillance that was carried out by the Public Health Agency of Canada. So that occurred from 2004 to 2012, where we found 124 cases confirmed in Canada. And from this period, the lessons that we learned was that one, LGV was largely believed to be a severely symptomatic infection. And that two, it particularly affected MSM living with HIV. Well, today in Canada, LGV is endemic among MSM and mainly those living with HIV. Getting into some transmission and treatment details. So like with urogenital chlamydia, transmission can occur with any type of sex, be it oral, anal, or vaginal. But the ratio of urethral to anorectal LGV is one to 15 in MSM. So recently though, prevalent studies have suggested that about 25% of infections are asymptomatic and thus transmission can be attributed in some part to these asymptomatic carriers. And we hypothesize that increased STI screening and in particular increased rectal STI screening may increase the detection of asymptomatic LGV infection. And this is particularly relevant because PrEP programs may act as a vehicle to precipitate that increased asymptomatic STI testing, and thus we sought to compare the epidemiology of LGV before and after widespread availability of PrEP programs. And finally, I do want to talk a little bit about treatment, and especially I want to highlight that treatment is different than uh, urogenital chlamydia with the duration of therapy that's quite a bit longer, and this really highlights the importance of getting the correct diagnosis here. Um, into our methods. So we completed a retrospective chart review of all LGV cases in BC from 2016 to 2022, where we looked for variables relevant to STI history. So PrEP use, sociodemographics, things like that. 
And um, case information for LGB cases occurring prior to 2016 was acquired from previous work published by the BCCDC. We then went ahead with some binomial logistic regression to compare the clinical presentation of LGV pre and post publicly funded PrEP. So from 2004 to 2021, the rate of LGV cases has been largely increasing in BC. While LGV is still a relatively low prevalence disease, there are some public health interventions in BC that may have influenced its detection. So in 2011, we started doing reflex testing on all symptomatic or asymptomatic chlamydia positive rectal samples for LGV. So what that means is if anybody tests positive on a chlam uh, for chlamydia on a rectal sample, it was automatically forwarded for testing for LGV. The following year, we then began routinely testing MSM for rectal STIs, including chlamydia and by, by chlamydia also LGV. Um, in the beginning of 2018, we introduced publicly funded PrEP programs, which were coupled with frequent STI screening protocols. And finally, the last two years, I don't need to remind everybody, have been dedicated to the COVID-19 response, where asymptomatic STI testing frequencies may have been affected. So among the 363 LGV cases in our period between 2015 and 2021, um, a third occurred pre-PrEP and two thirds occurred post-PrEP. Most post-PrEP cases were among HIV negative individuals and in particular individuals using PrEP. LGV is more likely to occur among HIV negative individuals post-PrEP than pre-PrEP. Um, and LGV cases who were using PrEP had a mean HERI MSM score of 24.6. And this is, corresponds to about a 7% annual risk of HIV without PrEP. HIV negative individuals were more likely to experience asymptomatic LGV infection relative to people living with HIV. Um, and PrEP users were more likely to experience asymptomatic LGV infection even beyond that. So relative to HIV negative PrEP non-users. So the proportion of asymptomatic LGV infection was higher among PrEP users compared to people living with HIV and HIV negative PrEP non-users. So ultimately, what we see is that there's similar rates of asymptomatic infection among both people living with HIV and HIV negative PrEP non-users compared to PrEP users, which presented at a much higher rate of asymptomatic infection. The temporality of this spike is really important to think about because it, it makes us think, what is the relevance of these PrEP programs? Because obviously PrEP doesn't like have activity against chlamydia. Um, so I wanna talk about one that PrEP programs are coupled with frequent STI screening. So quarterly STI screening in PrEP programs is what's driving this increased STI testing among PrEP users. And this increased testing in PrEP users may drive increased detection of LGV. Um, and this is relative to both HIV negative PrEP non-users um, and people living with HIV who really don't have like formal STI testing protocols the same way that we do in PrEP programs. And then two, PrEP may be driving less serosorting. So historically, LGV was typically seen in people living with HIV. And PrEP may also be driving increased serodiscordant sexual encounters because of attenuating fears of HIV transmission and greater awareness of U equals U in the community. Some strengths and limitation of our study. So we had seven years of data allowing for an assessment of both pre and post PrEP eras. We had the ability to determine sexual risk of PrEP users, and this was proxied by HERI MSM scores. But we also had some limitations. So individuals are only able to access publicly funded PrEP programs if they demonstrate sufficient risk relative, related to sexual activity. Um, and HIV negative individuals who are not on PrEP may then present a lower, uh, may represent a lower baseline risk for LGV. So adding chlamydia testing data is also necessary as it as changes in LGV testing can help contextualize changes in the presentation and the and, and the way that we're seeing LGV infections and diagnoses. So to conclude, LGV is often asymptomatic and particularly in PrEP users. Um, that concept of reflex testing of LGV chlamydia samples can help identify asymptomatic LGV infection and really ensure a proper duration of chlamydia treatment. 
uh, the pandemic and the related response measures may have driven decreased STI testing, particularly in individuals not enrolled in PrEP programs, so that includes people living with HIV and HIV negative PrEP non-users, or it may have di driven changes related to sexual behavior. And finally, future studies are going to be necessary to understand how asymptomatic STI testing programs influence the detection of LGV. Thank you everybody for, for your time and I'll hold for some questions. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. Um, I don't see any questions yet. So I have a question. The question I have is, what do you wanna see happen next? Um, what's some messaging or programs for gay, bisexual, and other um, men who have sex with men who are taking PrEP? And maybe um, some, some recommendations for clinicians? Yeah, I mean, I'd flip that around. I'd flip that a little bit because I think a lot of these recommendations are also for people that are not on PrEP. Um, with PrEP, we have this, this, these, this great infrastructure on getting tested at every PrEP visit, um, which is helping us catch LGV um, either before it's symptomatic or at it when it's, when it's or, which we don't really have for PrEP non-users or for people living with HIV. And that's also relevant, especially with the testing via swabs, so for rectal samples. So I guess it's a, com a combination of factors of ensuring that our populations that aren't on PrEP are having access to uh, routine screening as necessary, but also recognizing the importance of rectal STI testing, which is, which is still something that we do need to work on in the community. Thank you. And, and I, I wonder um, if there's, if you have any data or reflections. Um, so I don't see any questions. So I'm just going to ask another question um, on, on stigma. So is, you know, for me, I, I felt really hopeful about your message that when people are, are taking PrEP, they're getting more STI testing in your understanding. Is that like, for me, that seems like a, a message of hope and this is great. You know, people are, are getting more engaged um, in sexual health care. So I'm just wondering, is it also, do you think, reducing stigma around, around STI testing? I hope so. I think, I think that was, that was one of my goals, right? I think this is really a happy ending story because on one hand, there's that we're seeing, we're, we're getting access to more STI testing, but it's also that idea of like, this highlights the greater awareness of U equals U and that PrEP is an effective measure at preventing um, HIV transmission. So I think on one hand, like while we have seen the presentation shift into different populations, um, if we truly are seeing more serodiscordant relationships these days, I think that's a, that's a happy ending. Um, definitely. And I, I think there, I think we have time maybe for one last quick question. Um, Nathan, did you wanna ask it or write it for me to read? Sure. Yeah, and a great presentation. I'm, um, and I know you're you're working at BC, with BCCDC and and folks there. But I'm curious just a little bit about, Jun, is there opportunities to try and do some cross provincial work here? Because we know that prep became publicly available in BC and scaled up in a very different way than some other provinces. And so, might there be some opportunities to think about how to untangle um, how much of this is related to prep implementation versus other shifting pieces in the kind of landscape of of our sexual lives? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And um, especially because PHAC's like major surveillance program, LGB, at least the last report ended in 2012. And that's quite a long time ago now. So um, given that we've seen these, these changes um, in the presentation, I think it's absolutely warranted to start looking at this on an interprovincial level or like a national level. Um, because really, there hasn't been much literature on LGV since like in the last 10 years. Um, and that's not just a Canadian thing, that's internationally. Great, thank you so much um, for that really interesting presentation, very thought provoking, Emmett. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna introduce our next speaker, uh, Graham Berlin from X University who will be talking about effects of discrimination, psychological distress, and coping responses on meta, I'll just say meth use among gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men living with HIV, as well as those not living with HIV. Thank you, Carmen. Okay. Okay, so, we know that approximately um, 8 to 20% of Canadian 
um, GBM or gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men report having used meth in the past six to 12 months. And among GBM, meth is often used within a sexual context because it provides a number of perceived sexual benefits, including increased sexual stamina, prowess, and confidence. Um, we also know very, um, we know well that there's a, an association between meth use and sexual health outcomes with GBM who use methamphetamine reporting a greater number of sexual partners, more instances of condomless anal sex, as well as poor HIV medication adherence. Um, and there's reason to believe that those factors are related to the higher rates of STI and HIV transmission that we see among GBM who use methamphetamine. Um, and while understanding these associations between meth use and sexual health outcomes is of course important, it tells us very little about why GBM are using methamphetamine, um, as well as the factors that increase the likelihood that GBM will use methamphetamine. Um, and I believe that a better understanding of these factors would allow us to approach um, methamphetamine use among GBM more holistically and potentially elucidate new avenues of prevention and harm reduction. So in light of this, we developed a framework to that integrated theories and relevant factors um, thought to be related to substance use generally, as well as methamphetamine use specifically among GBM. And so the three theories that we, we that informed this model included minority stress, cognitive escape, and sexual compulsivity. Um, and the variables that are kind of implicated within these theories or implicated in research on methamphetamine use or substance use among GBM um, included childhood sexual abuse, heterosexist discrimination, psychological distress, cognitive escape, and sexual compulsivity. Um, and using these theories and factors, we developed a structural, a hypothesized structural equation model that modeled direct and indirect pathways related to methamphetamine use in the past six months among GBM. So this is the hypothesized structural equation model. Um, and in alignment with minority stress theory, um, we hypothesized that heterosexist discrimination would be associated with psychological distress. And that in turn, psychological distress would be positively associated with meth use in the past six months, um, which was a dichotomous yes, no variable. And then thinking about theories of sexual compulsivity, um, there is evidence that childhood sexual, sexual abuse is associated with both psychological distress as well as sexual compulsivity. Um, and we further hypothesize that childhood sexual abuse would be indirectly associated with sexual compulsivity through its association with psychological distress and that sexual compulsivity would mediate the association between psychological distress and methamphetamine use in the past six months. And then thinking about cognitive escape, um, which suggests that some individuals may be motivated to use substances to avoid thinking about HIV risk and other unpleasant thoughts and emotions during sex. We hypothesize that um, psychological distress would be positively associated with greater cognitive escape and that in turn, cognitive escape would be associated with a higher likelihood of reporting methamphetamine use in the past six months, and that cognitive escape would mediate the association between psychological distress um, and methamphetamine use in the past six months. Um, and within this model, it's important to note, we're kind of conceptualizing cognitive escape and sexual compulsivity as these coping behaviors or coping responses to, to stress or unpleasant emotions, um, and that these coping responses in particular increase the likelihood of reporting methamphetamine use in the past six months. So this study used baseline data from the Engage Cohort Study, which is a multi-site study that recruited cis and trans GPM um, who were 16 years of age or older and reported sex with another man in the past six months from Vancouver, Montreal, and Toronto. Um, we used respondent-driven sampling, which is a form of peer chain recruitment. Um, and participants came in to the lab or the clinic and completed computer-assisted questionnaires. And between 2017 and 2019, a total of 2,449 GBM were recruited. So for this analysis or these analyses, um, we use structural equation modeling um, and we modeled, uh, used, we modeled it separately for GBM living with HIV, um, where we had a sample of 423 as well as separately for HIV negative GBM with a sample of 1,800. Um, the model was fit using weighted least squares um, and it was estimated using RDS2 weights to adjust for sampling bias that results from um, respondent-driven sampling. 
And for all the, for both the models, demographic covariates were controlled for. So this included sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, age, income, and city of recruitment. Um, and we used kind of conventional guidelines to determine acceptable model fit. So looking at the results of the GBM living with HIV first, um, it was a good fit for the data. And as hypothesized, heterosexist discrimination was positively associated with psychological distress. However, contrary to our hypothesis, childhood sexual abuse was not associated with psychological distress. Um, and rather than being positively associated with sexual compulsivity, it was actually negatively associated with sexual compulsivity. Um, and again, contrary to our hypothesis, psychological distress was actually negatively associated with cognitive escape. Um, however, it was positively associated with sexual compulsivity. Um, and to improve model fit, we did include um, a direct path from sexual compulsivity to cognitive escape. Um, and this path was significant and positive. And in turn, cognitive escape was positively associated with methamphetamine use in the past six months. Um, the direct effects of psychological distress and sexual compulsivity when accounting for the other variables um, were not significantly directly associated with methamphetamine use in the past six months. And then looking at indirect effects, um, we found that psychological distress was associated with cognitive escape indirectly through sexual compulsivity, that sexual compulsivity was associated with meth use indirectly through cognitive escape, um, and then looking at sequential indirect effects, psychological distress was associated with meth use in the past six months through sexual compulsivity and cognitive escape. And then looking at the same model among HIV negative GBM, um, again, the model was a good fit for the data and a lot of the pathways were similar. So heterosexist discrimination, again, was positively associated with psychological distress. Um, again, no significant association between childhood sexual abuse and psychological distress. Um, in line with our hypothesis, childhood sexual abuse was positively associated with sexual compulsivity, um, as was the association between psychological distress and cognitive escape, um, as well as between psychological distress and sexual compulsivity. Again, we see a positive association between sexual compulsivity and cognitive escape, um, and in turn, cognitive escape was positively associated with meth use. Um, and again, psychological distress was not significantly associated directly with methamphetamine use, accounting for the other variables. However, sexual compulsivity remained significant and positive in association to meth use in the past six months. And again, the same indirect effects were found. So psychological distress associated with cognitive escape indirectly through sexual compulsivity, um, sexual compulsivity associated with meth use in the past six months indirectly through cognitive escape, and then testing sequential indirect effects indirect effects, again, psychological distress was associated with methamphetamine use in the past six months, indirectly through um, the effects of sexual compulsivity and cognitive escape. Okay, so to summarize a little bit, so among both subsamples, individuals who reported greater experiences of heterosexist discrimination also reported greater psychological distress. Um, and then looking at tests of sequential indirect effects, Individuals who reported greater psychological distress were more likely to report having used meth in the past six months. Um, and these effects occurred indirectly through sexual compulsivity and cognitive escape. Um, and then kind of in line with some of the mixed findings in the literature or contributing to these mixed findings, we found that childhood sexual abuse was negatively associated with sexual compulsivity among GBM living um, with HIV, but positively associated when looking at the HIV negative subsample. Um, and I think a takeaway from, from these analyses is that integrating theories can really provide a valuable framework for understanding and testing hypotheses that are related to meth use among GBM. So there were a, a number of limitations. So um, the cross-sectional data precludes any, um, any notions of causality or tests of causality. Um, the model did not account for bidirectional relationships, which I think most people would agree. Um, there are a number of bidirectional relationships likely present in, in a model like this, um, and there is a lack of intersectionality. And then thinking about in, um, implications, um, I think given the complex direct and indirect pathways associated with meth use among GBM, interventions need to account for the social and psychological, psychological factors that motivate 
or result from meth use. And, and by incorporating these factors into conventional methamphetamine related interventions, you may see additional benefits from these interventions as well as greater acceptability among GBM. And then interventions that address minority stress and provide GBM with additional coping skills may be effective at reducing meth related harms and may also reduce the likelihood that GBM initiate meth use in the first place. Um, and then with additional coping skills, GBM may be better equipped to manage stressors as well as their methamphetamine use, which may reduce methamphetamine related harms, including the transmission of HIV and STIs. Um, so future research is needed, of course, and I think um, there's a need to continue de developing and testing theories that help to explain the various motivations for meth use among GBM. Um, and relatedly, there's really this critical need in the research to differentiate between non-problematic and problematic meth use, um, as well as the factors that differentially um, associate with each of those. So in this model, we're only looking at methamphetamine use in the past six months, which loses that nuance of what's problematic and what's not problematic. Um, and that, that's really important as not all, not all methamphetamine use is problematic. Um, and I think there needs to be a greater differentiation within, the, within research on meth use among GBM. Um, so being able to understand factors that buffer against methamphetamine related harms, those factors that increase um, an individual's methamphetamine related harms are essential for the development of more targeted and effective interventions moving forward. Um, some references and acknowledgements and yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Graham. That was really interesting. And I also really appreciated your um, last note where you, where you said we need to differentiate between problematic and, and non-problematic uh, meth use, thinking um, how to move forward. Um, so I'm going to, I don't see any questions in the chat. Listeners, feel free to put some, question, some questions in the chat. Um, so I do have a question. What The question I had was, around other forms of stigma. You mentioned there was no intersectionality, but I, I know you, you, you collected a lot of data. So I'm wondering if um, poverty uh, or poverty-related poverty stigma, um, any stigma around drug use or substance use, racism or HIV stigma, were those associated also with psychological distress? And um, were they associated with different um, engagement with, with meth use? Just wondering. I'm sure you, you did a lot of analyses that are not presented here. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good question. And I know that looking at race ethnicity, um, when we compare you know, white participants to participants of color, there was no significant association just looking at bivariate correlations. Um, however, that's not, of course, the best way to look at those differences and subgroup analyses would be the ideal way to examine that. Um, I think one issue we constantly run into is not having a large enough sample size um, to, to test a lot of the things that we want to, um, especially using structural equation modeling, which, which calls for quite large samples. Um, but I do think that's definitely something that needs to be looked at in the future and probably something that um, could be extended in these analyses. So including things like HIV related stigma, um, you know, experiences of race related microaggressions, um, I think those would be definitely important things to, to um, extend these analyses as well as um, to be incorporated into future research. Thank you. And yeah, I'm excited to see all the things you will do with this. There is one question. Thank you. Um, and we only have two minutes, so, so maybe you can just give a brief response. Um, yeah. how, do you, how do you explain the change in the association between childhood sexual abuse and its associations with sexual compulsivity for people living with HIV and those not living with HIV? Yeah, I think that is a question when that, when those results came out, it was a question I'm still asking myself and I am still not 100% sure. Um, I think that, you know, there must be other variables um, kind of in between childhood sexual abuse and sexual compulsivity. And clearly there's, those variables are, um, have different associations for GBM living with HIV um, and HIV negative GBM. And I think that's one area because the, the research is so mixed on that association, there's clearly more going on there. And I think this just adds another piece to that, um, that there may be differences um, based on HIV status between that, um, that association. Um, 
so yeah, I think that that's an area. I don't have any good answers. And if anyone has any thoughts, I'm always open to hearing them. Um, but I think that's definitely an area for, for future exploration. Thank you so much, Graham. And, and yeah, listeners, um, feel free uh, to email Graham. And Trevor Hart said, great job, Graham. Looking forward to longitudinal analysis to understand more about predictors of uh, CM. Yes, Thank so. you, Trevor. Trevor is my supervisor. So hey, Trevor's Trevor. amazing. Shout out to Trevor. <laughs> um, okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, for the sake of, of time, and we only have about one minute left, um, we'll move to the next presenter, um, which is Nathan Lachowski, an associate professor at the University of Victoria, um, who will be speaking about population trends and impacts of undetectable equals untransmittable, U equals U, among gay, bisexual, queer, trans, and two-spirit men and non-binary non persons across Canada from 2015 to 2021. I'm looking forward to your talk, Nathan. Thank you, Carmen. Everyone can see my slides okay? Great. Um, I'm glad to be able to be here and present on behalf of my co-authors who are listed here on the first slide. Uh, my name is Nathan Lachowski. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, and I am calling in today from Lekwungen territories. These are the lands of the Sangha, Esquimalt, and Wasanich people on what's now known as Victoria, the south part of Vancouver Island. So in terms of background, um, we're here at CAR, so I think folks have heard and know lots about U equals U. Um, this was officially endorsed by Canada in 2018, following a lot of community advocacy and endorsement from a number of community agencies, Youth Co HIV and Hep C Society being one of the first. Um, but we don't have a lot of longitudinal data or studies that have been able to or evaluate how U equals U has been implemented over time and taken up uh, in community. So that's really the goal of this presentation is to look at population level trends um, amongst gay, bisexual, trans, two-spirit and queer men and non-binary people. Um, in relation to both knowledge items in terms of knowledge related to U equals U, but also in terms of sexual behavior. And we're gonna take a three HIV group approach to this. So we'll be looking at this uh, amongst participants who are living with HIV, those who are HIV negative uh, and on PrEP, and those who are HIV negative and not on PrEP. So the data for this analysis come from the Sex Now study, which has been running for um, over two decades now. Um, and uh, I was had the fortune of being able to uh, take over as a research director at CVRC from Dr. Trey Trussler in 2017. So these are community-based surveys, um, and they are run in English and French. They are repeated cross-sectional. So these are not a longitudinal cohort or within-person design. So we're taking snapshots of the community um, over successive periods of time. So in 2015, 19, 20, and 21, those samples were collected online and the recruitment happened through uh, sociosexual websites and apps like Grindr and Scruff and Squirt, um, but also through community-based organizations, social media and email lists. And then in 2018, we recruited participants in person at pride festivals in urban settings across the country. To be eligible, participants had to be at least 15 years old, live in Canada, and either identify as non-heterosexual or report recent sex with a man, so basically a behavioral or identity entry. For or sex now, women were ineligible to participate. In terms of the actual analytic methods, we're looking at temporal trends really as the primary analysis piece here. And so we're doing that by looking at separate multivariate logistic regressions by those three HIV prep status groups. And so survey year in these analyses is our primary explanatory variable included as a continuous, um, a continuous format. And in these multivariate analysis, we control for age, education, ethno-racial identity, and sex gender identity. And when we have the behavioral outcomes, we're also controlling for a number of recent sexual partners as a bit of an attempt to try and address some of the shifts that we know COVID has had on our sexual landscape. So in terms of the results and the figures, you'll see odds ratios and adjusted odds ratios uh, with 95% confidence intervals, and those are for the temporal trends over time. So this is a little bit about the sample. So in total, there's just over 24,000 responses that have been collected across these five rounds of sex now. Um, it was relatively stable in terms of being uh, about eight or nine percent of the sample living with HIV. Um, what you can see in blue are the bars for HIV negative participants that uh, were not PrEP users. Um, that decreases over time as PrEP became a greater uh, implemented uh, more. And then the red bars um, show the folks who were HIV negative on PrEP. And again, you can see that increase with a little bit of um, a variation there in terms of thinking about COVID. <clears throat> 
And demographically, um, the figure on the left is age. And I wanted to show age just because it does kind of highlight um, one of the variations over time for some of our demographic factors. Um, in particular, in 2018, when we were in person at Pride Festivals, that sample was uh, during uh, almost 40% aged, uh, aged under 30 years. And then in terms of ethno-racial identity, three quarters of the sample is white, 5% self-identify as Indigenous, 3% as African, Caribbean, or Black, and 13% as uh, another person of color. In terms of gender identities, 92% were cis men, 4% trans men, and 4% non-binary. And in terms of geography, this is a largely urban uh, study with 7% reporting being from rural or remote areas, and a third of participants had high school education or less. And so we're controlling for uh, during a number of these demographics in the multivariate trends. So let's start looking at some of those. So we're gonna have a series of these figures. So I'm just gonna take a little bit of an extra moment here to talk you through um, how these figures work. Uh, there are three lines, again, to denote the three different HIV or PrEP groups. The red line is for HIV negative participants who are on PrEP, the blue line for those who are HIV negative not on PrEP, and the orange line for those living with HIV. These numbers here represent the percentages reporting that particular outcome uh, in that year of the survey. And then on the right-hand side, uh, next to each of those trend lines are the associated um, results from the univariate and multivariate analyses. If they are bold, that denotes a significant trend. So here, um, this measure is about knowing that medications taken daily by someone living with HIV can make uh, an HIV viral load undetectable. What we see here is during significant increases from 2015 um, uh, with over the last three years, uh, up to 100% amongst folks living with HIV in 2021, and also very high amongst folks who are on uh, an HIV negative on PrEP. And while we still had it saw an increase amongst those who were negative and not on PrEP, um, only 84% of folks were aware of this when they took the survey in 2021. Our second um, knowledge item is um, knowing about U equals U explicitly. Uh, and this we started asking in 2018, so there's no data from 2015, unfortunately. Um, and what we see here are increasing trends for all three groups. Again, um, again, very high levels of knowledge in terms of folks living with HIV and those who are negative and on PrEP. Um, and uh, an increasing trend again for those not on PrEP, um, but still about three quarters of guys um, in this study not being aware uh, of U equals U at the time of survey in 2021. So now we're going to shift gears into some of the behavioral measures, and I've just picked a few here to highlight given the short presentation. So um, what we see here is uh, a behavioral reporting of having any anal sex with an HIV positive undetectable partner in the past six months. These again were measured from 2018 to 2021. Uh, the only significant trend here over time is actually for HIV negative guys who are on PrEP. And contrary to what some folks might um, have expected, this trend is a decreasing trend over time. So we're actually seeing less um, guys who are on PrEP reporting having a positive undetectable partner less um, in 2021 than 2018. Of course, we need to keep in mind that some of these changes are related to COVID. And so during untangling that is, uh, is quite complex. There's no change over time in, um, for folks living with HIV or those who are not on PrEP. But of note, during roughly half of guys living with HIV report having an undetectable partner compared with only 7% of those who are not on PrEP. The next behavioral uh, measure is about reporting any anal sex with a partner whose HIV status was different than their own. Um, so this can sometimes be thought about in terms of um, serodiscordant or serodifferent sex. Uh, what we see here are two significant trends for the HIV negative participant groups, both decreasing again over time. Both of those are also really lowly reported. So in 2021, um, a very small portion of folks reporting sex with a, uh, someone of a different HIV status. Um, no change over time for folks living with HIV. Um, and again, around half of those participants living with HIV reporting a zero different partner. And here's our third and final behavioral measure that we're gonna to show today. Um, this one's a little bit messier in terms of the trends over time. Um, so you can see some shifts for um, HIV positive participants. Um, and we do have a significant increasing trend over time um, for uh, reporting that they only had condomless sex if a partner was HIV positive viral load undetectable. And we don't see any change over time in the other two HIV negative groups. And again, a relatively small proportion of, uh, of people reporting that. Although for all of these measures in terms of knowledge and behavior, folks on PrEP far more likely to endorse um, than those not on PrEP. So we also asked in 2021 a question about the impacts of U equals U um, for folks who are living with HIV. 
So we asked participants whether um, any of these issues increased or decreased as a result of U equals U. So what I've bolded here are some of the good news stories. So during pause participants reported feeling decreased um, feelings of shame, stigma, and rejection by sexual partners. And the percentages here indicate the number of participants who reported that. And then increased levels of mental well-being, quality of sex life, social well-being, and access to sexual partners. However, I think it's also important to point out descriptively that we also had uh, during sizable minorities of, of, of folks living with HIV report that there were decreased, decreased access to sexual partners um, as a result of U equals U and also increased pressure to get and maintain an undetectable viral load as well as pressure to take medication. So in terms of strengths and limitations, um, as I pointed out before, this is a repeated cross-sectional de design and not a cohort. And that does help us better in terms of measuring knowledge because in a cohort, once you tell people about things, they should know about it. Um, but it does challenge a little bit of the statistical assumptions around independence. Untangling the impacts of COVID is quite difficult. We know there's been shifts in sexual behavior, but also in terms of need for and access to PrEP. Um, and we've also know that during the way in which we sample and are able to access community changes uh, both our sampling frame and people's willingness and ability to participate. And finally, while we're using SexNow data across all of this, and that does help, um, there are changes in the study description and eligibility over time. Again, we had online and in-person recruitment in this analysis, but we have generally been working towards better inclusion of trans men, two-spirit, and non-binary people over time. So quickly in conclusion, the self-reported impacts of equals you for folks living with HIV are mixed. During, I think this reflects siloed conversations about only talking about U equals U to folks living with HIV as opposed to a more universal campaign with all of the community. It may also reflect the ways in which U equals U is being taken up in provider interactions. All of this needs to be looked at in terms of qualitative work. There are certainly some tensions highlighted here between antiretroviral viral based prevention in terms of PrEP and undetectable viral load and what impacts that has on our discussions as members of the community in terms of HIV with our sexual partners, the behaviors that we engage in, uh, the sexual mixing, which is a kind of network term in terms of how much folks living with HIV versus those on PrEP are interacting with each other, as well as how this impacts stigma. In sum, the final conclusion really is that while U equals U knowledge has increased over time, and that's a success that we can tout, behavioral uptake certainly remains incommensurate. My email is there if people have questions, and of course we have some time now as well. And just finally, I want to acknowledge our participants, our community partners, and our collaborators and funders who make all this work year over year possible, along with our staff team and our research working group. And lastly, just a plug, because we're here, um, we've gotten lots of feedback about sex now and why it can't be for the broader community. And I'm glad to say that we've just launched a study last week called Our Health, which is for all two-spirit and LGBTQIA plus folks across Canada. There's a small honor area for this online survey. It's available in English, French, and Spanish. And uh, we're working with EGAL, the Enchanté Network, and Two Spirits in Motion Society for this. And you can go to cbrc.net to learn more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan. That was so fascinating. Uh, very, very interesting findings. Um, we actually have a question. Thank you, Devin, um, who says, as a person living with HIV, U equals U is great. It is most applicable in terms of sexual practices, but U equals U has little impact in reducing stigma for many living with HIV. There needs some further work or campaign to address HIV stigma across Canada and the globe. And I was just wondering if, if you know, you could respond to that and maybe um, any ideas you have for such campaigns. Yeah, Devin, uh, thank you so much for your comment and for sharing that. I completely agree. I mean, I think this is really the piece around during, while we've raised knowledge of you equals you, how much has that really shifted attitudes? And if you think about behaviors as a kind of um, a downstream aspect to attitudes, then do you know what I mean? Has this really changed the way in which during we're interacting and, and interchanging as a community? And in general, I would actually say it seems like the mix between what's happening with U equals U and what's happening in prep has actually potentially created some greater silos. It's a bit hard to untangle that with COVID, but I think your point is very well taken that I think we actually need to more directly confront stigma and, and think about what our campaigns and interventions are for that. And it can't just be about talking to positive folks about HIV stigma. It has to be talking about the folks that are enacting that stigma on folks living with HIV. And I think that's the part where during U equals U has kind of become the pause message in conversation and PrEP has become HIV negative message in conversation. And these silos really need to be broken down. So I know there's some great talks that have uh, happened in this, are happening in the session. And so I think there will be some, some great opportunities to kind of connect some of the different research that's being done around this. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see uh, any uh, any other 
Oh, great. We have another, people are warming up. They're, they're asking some questions now. Um, is, is it only me or it seems that lately everyone is on prep on the apps, but no one mentions you equals you. And we only have one minute. So yeah, we sure, go quickly. I, mean, I think this is such a great point. There's some amazing work that's done some kind of like uh, analysis of thinking about what content is shared and what isn't. I think this really speaks to this aspect of do you know what I mean, are we having the same conversation about HIV anymore? Are we having conversations about HIV? What is tolerable or acceptable or um, easy within apps to be able to converse about and what isn't? And I mean, if we're not talking about you equals you, to me, that's also to Devin's point, an indicator of stigma, right? I mean, it's outing someone as living with HIV and if folks aren't comfortable doing that, then we clearly have work to do still because everyone should feel free to try and live with their HIV status and be able to express their, um, their connection to that. So I, I really enjoyed um, the questions and your responses and just thinking maybe there has been a better job destigmatizing PrEP than really just stigmatizing HIV as, and, and people living with HIV, especially regarding U equals U. So thank you so much. And we're, uh, we're just on time, which is wonderful. So thank you, Nathan. And, and I'm sure you can all email Nathan with your, your questions and thoughts. Um, so I'm super pleased to introduce the next speaker. Alex Wells, who's a doctoral student at the University of Victoria, um, who will be speaking about peace of mind, prep use, HIV related anxiety and HIV stigma in gay, bisexual and other men who have sex with men in British Columbia. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, I think folks should be able to see my screen now. Um, cool. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Alex Wells. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Victoria. I use he, him, and they, them. Uh, and today I will be presenting some findings from the first year of data collection from the PRIMP study on the impact that PRIP has had uh, on gay, bisexual, queer, queer, and other dudes into dudes in British Columbia uh, in terms of their anxiety about HIV, stigma towards other gay, bi, queer dudes living with HIV. Uh, and yeah, let's just dive in. Uh, and also, if I currently feel like I'm just talking to my ring light, so if I don't click through or something, please someone try and get my attention. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria stands, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. The study is also, though, tied to the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam people, as well as the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit, and that this land is governed under the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt in Ontario. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge off the jump all the folks who sat down with me on Zoom to share their thoughts and experiences about sex, dating, mental health, prep, uh, pretty early on in the pandemic. And I'm incredibly grateful for the folks that took the time to share their stories with me. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that this project would not happen without the support of the Canadian Institute for Health Research and the Canadian HIV Trials Network. Uh, lastly, I couldn't be doing this work without uh, the support of SHRC, so thank you as well. Um, cool. So uh, what do we know about PrEP and HIV anxiety? We know that anxiety, the anxiety that gay, bisexual, and queer, and other dudes into dudes experience around HIV can have negative impacts on their lives. It can make them less willing to get tested for HIV. It can facilitate negative mental health outcomes like depression and anxiety. And it can also fuel those anxieties, uh, sometimes for months after a sexual interaction or experience. We also know that addressing this anxiety is a key reason that gay by queer dudes might initiate PrEP. Uh, and in the last couple of years, we've also started to see that PrEP has reduced HIV anxiety for gay by queer men and has also been reported to increase pleasure. So great news, high fives all around. Uh, HIV stigma uh, is also associated with, H uh, with negative outcomes like anxiety and depression for gay by queer dudes who are living with HIV. And during the same time period that PrEP has been increasingly prescribed to gay by queer men, there's also been the advent of the U equals U campaign to challenge the stigma that people living with HIV experience. U equals U or undetectable equals untransmissible is a campaign launched in 2016 to raise awareness of the biological reality that a person with an undetectable viral load is unable to transmit HIV through sexual contact. Uh, furthermore, some gay by queer men saw the advent of PrEP as another way to potentially address the stigma that they experienced uh, particularly from HIV-negative gay by queer dudes. Uh, 
So uh, just a quick note about the study itself. Uh, PRIMP is a mixed methods longitudinal study happening right now in both Ontario and British Columbia. For the qualitative arm of the study, participants were recruited mainly through sexual health clinics in Vancouver and Victoria. Uh, to participate, they had to be over the age of 19, be HIV negative, and identify as gay, bi, queer, or a man having sex with other men. Uh, Semi-structured interviews were conducted over Zoom and transcripts were analyzed using a thematic analysis. Uh, and participants were asked about a bunch of things, uh, their access to PrEP, their sexual health, their mental health, and also uh, their thoughts on sex and their sexual experiences more broadly. Uh, interviews were between 40 and 5 and 90 minutes as well. Uh, all in all, 20 guys participated in British Columbia. They identified as gay, queer, and two-spirit. Um, everyone at the time of the interview was either on PrEP or had been on PrEP. Like I mentioned earlier, this was at the start of the pandemic, so some folks had uh, taken a break from PrEP uh, in response to public health uh, restrictions or lockdowns. Uh, we had a racially and economically diverse group of participants, and the average age was just short of uh, just under 40 years old. Uh, at the time of the interviews, the guys I spoke to were dating, they were hooking up, they were uh, engaged in kink and fetish, they were in open relationships, and like I said, some of them were also taking a break from sex. So first of all, uh, when asked about what the best thing about being on PrEP was for uh, participants almost all said the peace of mind that it gave them. And actually, interestingly, often in those exact words. I, I don't know if there's like a poster out there in some clinic that says peace of mind, but if so, the branding, on point. Excellent, great uptake. Uh, Luca, for example, shared uh, the best thing about being on PrEP, a certain peace of mind that you can enjoy sex the way you want to enjoy it without a condom, with a minor risk of contracting HIV. Or if I do use a condom that it gives me and my partner an uh, extra layer of protection. Uh, Lucas' quote demonstrates both the sense of relief that PrEP has given, but also the impact that it has had on his pleasure or the sex that he's looking to have. Oscar said, uh, I used to be freaking out every time I was tested for HIV and that one or two minutes when you're getting the rapid test and you're waiting to see if it's one dot or two. And if uh, you start to see not only the level of anxiety that PrEP has reduced, but also the way that it impacts testing in this quote. If you've ever taken a rapid test, maybe you can kind of relate to that feeling of you know, like your stomach dropping or that anxiety as you wait those uh, in that short period of time to see how many dots are showing up. Um, so yeah, again, uh, we've seen PrEP has been really effective at giving folks this, this feeling of peace of mind. Uh, now, in our interviews, guys were also asked about their understanding of both the efficacy of PrEP and what they know about U equals U, uh, and kind of building also or supporting of what Dr. Lachowski just shared. Everyone was very knowledgeable about both um, and said that they believed in both the efficacy and the, the messaging around U equals U. However, there were still guys that when we asked if PrEP had changed whether or not they would have sex with a guy living with HIV, uh, they, they felt a lingering sense of fear about HIV, despite their knowledge and faith in PrEP and U equals U. So, so Hale shared, uh, not really, like I still have a bit of stigma and irrational fear that I'm having sex with an HIV positive guy, regardless of whether they're detectable or not. And that I'm on PrEP, it's still, I think, let's just say I wouldn't be feeling comfortable to have sex with a guy, even though I know he might be taking his medication. I'm taking PrEP, we use a condom. It's still a rational fear that I'm gonna get it. And what's interesting here is that, so how literally names it as stigma towards people living with HIV and that this fear, he identifies it as irrational, but it's still lingering even through condom use. And so there's something still stuck here that uh, biomedical intervention and knowledge isn't addressing. Uh, and while some guys like Sohail might identify it as stigma and potentially feel some shame about that, that wasn't necessarily the case for everyone. Andreas shared, I'm just like, I don't want to do it. It's my body. I can do whatever the hell I want. It doesn't mean I don't understand all the facts. And so Andres is highlighting how he can define the terms of who he has sex with and for what reasons, uh, but also that he, he understands, again, uh, the implications of PrEP or the implications of U equals U. And Eric shared, uh, no, I'm still afraid of, like, whenever I see HIV positive, I know that it's undetectable and I know that the chances are really low. So both of these quotes demonstrates the limits of that biomedical understanding, and both participants felt very knowledgeable and had trust in the efficacy of both PrEP and U equals U, but it didn't end their fear uh, or their stigmatizing thoughts about people living with HIV. 
So while I've highlighted the guys who were not comfortable having sex with guys living with HIV, that wasn't the case for everybody who we spoke with, or who I spoke with. Uh, and that there were many guys in the study who were who had internalized the messaging around PrEP and U equals U's, and it had changed their attitudes. Some guys like Vincent, who shared, uh, since I'm on PrEP, yeah, I feel comfortable hooking up with undetectable people. Uh, the on PrEP will fuck approach. Big fan. Great. Uh, other participants, like Michael shared, uh, I know they're undetectable, so it's no risk of transmission, but also me being on PrEP, again, it's more peace of mind, right? Um, and so we see again how U equals U and PrEP have really shaped uh, Michael's view, but also how it's contributed to this uh, reduction in HIV anxiety and uh, possible improvement in his mental health. So, so what? So PrEP has decreased HIV anxiety for gay by queer men who are taking it in BC, and U equals U has effectively communicated the relationship between viral load and transmission to gay by queer dudes. This has helped to address the stigmatizing view towards gay by queer men living with HIV. However, there's still um, reticence or fear among some gay by queer men, and uh, this has this demonstrates the limitations of biomedical interventions to address HIV stigma through either consciousness raising around biomedical intervention or through medical intervention specifically, as is the case with PrEP. Um, further research is needed then to figure out how do we effectively reach those who still hold on to that fear, who that fear is lingering. What can we learn from campaigns like Love Positive Women that are action oriented and not just around consciousness raising? Uh, in this case, we are asked specifically to love positive women and not just raise awareness around uh, undetectability. Uh, what about, what can we learn potentially from community champions models like that used to engage uh, gay by queer men in prep conversations uh, over the last couple of years? Uh, I don't have answers to these questions, but rather I'm inviting thoughts and suggestions or considerations from other folks. Um, yeah, and would be interested to hear what other people have to say as well. So quickly, there's some limitations that are worth considering in the study. All the folks I spoke to were both on PrEP and able to get it through the province here in British Columbia. They were also recruited predominantly through sexual health clinics uh, in urban areas. So all of this might mean that there were, they had more awareness of PrEP and U equals U and may not speak to the experience of those who are unable to access those spaces. The study, however, has we spoke to a pretty diverse group of guys with different experiences around PrEP and sex lives and all of that jazz. Um, and it's also a longitudinal study, so we can further explore these themes moving forward and see what, if anything, changes over the next couple of years. Uh, if anyone has any comments or questions or wants to send me an email or hate mail or whatever, here's where you can reach me. Um, I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. That was really, really interesting. And I love the love positive women. Um, shout out at the end. We actually have a question from Allison K. I think I know who okay. that is. Um, thanks, Allison. Hi, Alex. Awesome presentation. Thank you. Uh, did you see any themes about increased sexual pleasure uh, slash satisfaction with uptake of PrEP? So, yes. Uh, so some guys, uh, there was a, some guys shared this feeling of intimacy um, and some guys literally just talked about like, yeah, it feels good to have sex without a condom. Um, so like there's both that like very physical yes piece. And then there's also that very like, um, relational piece of like, uh, connection. Um, so it's not really captured in this, in like the data that I presented here, but, um, yeah, there's, uh, definitely, um, a conversation that guys are having around that, like, this is a prep has allowed me to feel good in the sex that I'm having or feel better or pleasurable, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you so much. I have two questions, so you only have time to answer one, so you can choose which one. Oh, no. Um, okay. <laughs> they're by questions. So um, one of them is around if there was any findings um, that varied based on the, the so social um, positions that, that your participants held. And the second question I have is, so we know a lot of the roots of stigma are um, around moral blame, shame, and othering, but also access to power and resources. So I, I just wonder if, if, if like applying a, you know, the stigma power or some sort of lens where we see, is this, 
is it treatment literacy that's that's missing or prevention literacy? Is it that simple or is it also people maybe having constrained access to power in some parts of their life and then trying to enact sexual agency um, in this decision making? I don't know if, if that makes sense. I was just trying to understand this this um, gap between knowledge and, and, and practice when it comes to stigma. Totally. And so both of those are excellent questions. And I can actually maybe try and like thread the needle and get at both of them. Um, so I, I chose those two quotes around um, like the person who was like, it's my body. I can fuck who I want for whatever reason I want. And that person who was like, I feel like yeah about it specifically because like it kind of captured the two feelings of like uh, entrenched I'm not doing this and the like um that feeling of guilt or shame or like that like really discomfort and so I think that like there's also potentially to the point around like uh position there might I don't think that there's necessarily like one way that we can address this because there seems to be different ways that people are still navigating that stigma or like or even or at least articulating the stigma if that makes sense um so I think that there's I, I, to the second point, I don't think that there is necessarily just about like a consciousness raising, like we can create more information about biomedical and like blah, 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 as opposed to like, no, like, I think we actually need to do some like really deep seated unpacking of stigma with people. And that can't just be like a brochure that necessarily gets handed out by a, a nurse in a an STI clinic. Um, I don't have like concrete data to really back that up. That's just currently how I've understood uh, the data so far, if that makes any sense. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. We're not gonna brochure our, our way out of it. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, and so moving on to our next really exciting presentation by uh, Dr. Cornell Gray, who's a postdoctoral fellow at University of Toronto, um, who will be um, presenting quote, are you the one who ate the bat, quote, BIPOC, gay and bisexual men's experience of racial discrimination during multiple pandemics. Welcome, Cornell. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I think we're on. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Carmen, for that uh, introduction. Um, yeah, so Carmen already introduced uh, the title of uh, my presentation today, I'm presenting on behalf of uh, the Engage team, um, the co-authors are listed there, so I'll just uh, jump right in. Um, so in the wake of the COVID-19 epidemic, um, anti-Asian racism, and the 2020 anti-racist protests following the death of George Floyd, um, several scholars have framed the convergence of racism and COVID-19 as a as a twin pandemic. Um, for some, the compounded impact of racism and COVID-19 mirrors previous research on race and HIV epidemic, specifically the, the disproportionate impact of viral infectious disease epidemics on racialized communities. Um, so in, in this paper, we examine, well, or examine examination rather of discrimination in this paper um, during COVID-19 draws on critical race theory as an analytical lens to unpack the underlying and historic social and political conditions that uniquely affect how racialized gay, bisexual, queer, and or um, other men who have sex with men or GDQM, as I'll be using for um, as we go on, um, how they experienced uh, the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, so, and so in the larger paper, we think through how racism comes to shape the lives of the GBQM of color during and beyond COVID-19. Um, so for instance, for instance, in the, the US, a higher concentration of COVID-19 cases, severe illness and death have been recorded among black indigenous racialized and immigrant communities, um, often attributed to race-based discrimination of social inequality distribution rather of social inequality, such as crowded housing conditions, economic precarity, infrastructural neglect. Um, in Canada, race-based data isn't systematically collect collected with systematically collected with COVID-19 infection rates, um, but Choi and others did find, found that um, COVID-19 infections was highest among communities uh, with higher concentrations of black and or low income residents, for example. Um, so all this in mind, we really wanted to kind of examine and understand how racism was shaping the experiences of GBQM of color 
um, during the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, so a bit of um, some background in terms of the, the methods. So the, the data I'll be sharing with you today um, are derived from a larger uh, mixed methods uh, engaged COVID-19 study, which is a sub-study of the, the engaged study. Um, that is all, that, that all, that's, so I mean, Graham is also a part of that, that, that study, um, but I'm working with the engaged COVID team specifically. And so we are examining how the, examining the impacts rather of the COVID-19 um, epidemic on the social lives, social and sexual lives of GBQM living in Montreal, Toronto and Vancouver. Uh, engaged COVID-19 began in September, 2020, and is, um, as I said, part of an ongoing multi-city cohort study examining HIV, STBBIs and the sexual health of GBQM in Canada. Um, and I'll be speaking specifically about the work we've been doing on the qualitative arm of the study. Uh, so we conducted 93 in-depth qualitative uh, interviews over two rounds with the GBQM, um, 30 in Montreal uh, and Vancouver, uh, 33 in Toronto. Um, we interviewed 42 participants in the first round and 51 in the with new participants in the in the second round. Um, we use purposive sampling to capture as much as possible the diverse experiences of GBQM during the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, and so we were really interested in um, recruiting uh, participants with diverse experiences in terms of age, ethno-racial background, gender, sexuality, and HIV status. Um, and participants were then identified based on uh, quantitative data gathered from the engaged cohort study and contacted uh, for a qualitative interview afterwards. Um, so just a, some brief uh, snapshots of the results. So out of the 93 uh, interviews conducted, 59 participants identified as Black, Indigenous, and or person of color. Um, the majority of BIPOC participants identified as mixed race uh, for this particular subset. Uh, the mean age was around 36 years, uh, approximately 14% of participants identified as Black, uh, most of whom resided in Toronto, um, almost a quarter of participants identified as East, Asia, as East Asian, um, and most of these participants uh, lived in Vancouver. Uh, and then the majority of participants identified as cisgender and gay as well. Um, about a one-fifth of participants reported living with HIV. Um, so today I'll just be taking you through a few quick highlights in terms of the, the themes that we that stood out to us during our analysis. Um, so anti-Asian racism during the, the first wave. So East Asian GBQM interviewed in the first round of interviews described multiple experiences uh, where they were harassed or discriminated against based on their perceived race. Um, in some cases, you know, these encounters manifested as heated confrontations. Um, in other instances, participants observed uh, individuals intentionally keeping their distance um, for, for a perceived fear of acquiring COVID-19. Uh, several participants noted that anti-Asian racism was quite common in their lives prior to, uh, to COVID-19, but it, it, it increased within the context of COVID-19. Um, GBQM across all three cities described incidents in which they were singled out in public and verbally assaulted uh, during the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, and one such participant here um, talked about an experience where he was harassed on the subway, but of course this was happening in all sorts of places. Um, you know, while you're running errands, while you're on your way to work, um, even at work. Um, and so it was actually quite pervasive. Uh, some East Asian GBQM in our sample talked about uh, wearing face masks for COVID-19 to prevent other people from getting sick when they were ill. Um, during COVID-19, however, face masks became a compounding factor uh, for the racism that they, for the racism experienced by participants um, interviewed in the first round in particular. Um, and so these participants felt that uh, wearing face masks made them targets um, during COVID-19, so much so that we even had one participant um, from, from Vancouver talk about the fact that he and his family were actually scared to go outside wearing a mask because they felt that um, it would really in, it, it basically increase their chances of getting harassed while they were out in public. On the other hand, for uh, some of the Black GBQ that we interviewed, wearing a face mask in public meant experiencing increased surveillance, 
um, which is not unique to Black GBQM. This is actually something that's been reported um, among uh, Black men generally during COVID-19. Um, and so we had one Toronto participant who talked about how difficult it was um, navigating social settings, settings with a mask on and being self-conscious about appearing friendly enough. Um, there was a Vancouver participant um, who shared a story um, where he was, you know, outside his property and a neighbor who didn't recognize him with his mask on came up and told him to get off the property. Um, you know, and, and, you know, he talks about how even though he was trying to do the right thing, it's, it's increasing, it's, 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 it's becoming a, uh, a problem for his health in a different kind of way because it means dealing with, with racism more often uh, in his everyday life. So the impact of COVID-19 on the forms of racism experienced by GBQ of color extended beyond um, anxieties about acquiring the coronavirus and its impact on their health. Um, some GBM, GBQM of color expressed concern that they were seen as potential vectors of COVID-19 transmission and that perception actually had a negative impact on their sexual lives. So um, an East Asian GBQM in Montreal talked about experiencing sexual racism online because in his words, people felt that, quote, they were being reminded of COVID when they saw him, end quote. Um, and so this resulted in him experiencing racist insults on virtual platforms. In a different, you know, uh, in another, another interview, a Toronto participant stated that he was worried that COVID-19 would lead to more discrimination in the gay community, right? So he explained that before COVID-19, white men didn't want to pursue a relationship with him, and COVID-19 increased his anxieties or rather the impact of racism on his dating life during COVID. Um, and to be more specific, this participant who is um, a newcomer to Canada from Latin America talked about traveling during COVID. And when he came back um, to the city, his friends asked him if he brought back COVID-19 with him. So there's a very particular narrative, narrative about how um, people are um, understanding COVID-19 transmission, how you're assigning it to um, race, ethnicity, nationality, and so on. Um, and so what we're seeing is uh, politics of desirability where some individuals are effectively um, being defined as clean uh, and, and unclean. And, and often those who are designated as quote unquote unclean are often racialized immigrant people. Uh, so in terms of uh, discussions, our findings underscore the pervasive and multiscalar impacts of racism during COVID. Um, participants in our study often described racism as ubiquitous, as many GBQ of color were used to hearing racist remarks or being told that they do not belong in a given space. Um, within the context of COVID-19, um, the proliferation of bold-faced racist harassment created immediate and acute safety risks for people of color as evidenced by the experiences reported by uh, GBQM in our study. Um, we found indications that COVID-19 is uniquely restructuring the sexual lives of uh, many GBQM of color. Um, although everyone, of course, experienced limitations to in-person sex following provincial lockdowns, um, sorry, including social distancing requirements, people of color experience COVID-19 specific sexual racism in both physical and virtual platforms. Uh, several participants, as I've said, as I've shared, share their concerns about being discriminated against based on their perceived affiliation with a particular racial group. Um, and so the expectation that uh, GBQM of color or GBQM of color, generally speaking, must prove that they are not COVID positive was not just an example of quote unquote COVID safe practices, right? It's really grounded in a world worldview that um, understands racialized people as a, as a danger um, to public health in all these in different sorts of ways. So for example, in their recent work, R. Scott and others detailed how um, black HIV negative men experienced HIV related stigma resulting from the racialization of HIV. Um, what we're seeing in um, based on the data that we've gathered, the, the racialization of COVID-19 has already taken place as well. And so uh, this process affects how GBQM, uh, this process affects GBQ, GBQM of color differently and unevenly, um, but it also references existing sexual discourses regarding the quote unquote cleanliness and trustworthiness of GBQM of color. Um, and as I've said, you know, one of our East Asian participants said that 
um, COVID-19 is imagined by many as a quote-unquote Chinese virus, and so uh, potential partners may assume that East Asian people are carriers of the virus based on their perceived ethnicity. Um, so just to wrap up uh, fairly quickly, racism continues to be an epidemic and an ongoing public health crisis for GB term of color during the COVID-19 and the ongoing HIV epidemic. Um, it also poses a significant challenge to GB trim social connections as racist and gendered assumptions about individuals' bodies and behaviors inform how GB trim are treated in their public and private lives. And our findings uh, demonstrate the relevance and the urgency really of critical race theory to the study of both the COVID-19 and HIV epidemics um, and the lives of uh, racial and sexual minority um, populations. So um, I'll pause it uh, there for now, you know, here's some references and um, thank you to um, our uh, sponsors as well. So looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Cornell. We're actually at uh, time. There's like one minute, but maybe in your oh, minute, sure. uh, I'll pose a question, which is, you know, aligned with critical race theory um, is notions of solidarity and um, resistance to intersecting stigma and oppression. So in like 30 seconds, like, did that come up in the data? Like, are, is the, you know, like queer, sexually diverse community challenging um, some of them challenging this racism or, you know, are people kind of fighting against it? I know we don't have much time, but just a few quick thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll just say um, briefly that um, we did have a lot of um, participants, um, particularly um, white participants who were talking about, who were kind of like pushing back against um, the kinds of racism that uh, GBQ of color have been, or people of color generally have been experiencing during COVID and a lot of participants were using, you know, um, the HIV epidemic as a point of comparison just to explain or to think through like um, why particular instances of discrimination are occurring, how they can fight um, back against that. And then some people actually did talk about how they were participating in, for example, some of the protests that were happening around um, during the summer of, of, of 2020. So I do think, um, yeah, there, there is this kind of like energy and effort among, you know, members of the, the community to kind of like push back against some of these racist narratives. So, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, really enjoyed your talk. And last but not least, really excited to hear from uh, Dr. Jordan Sang um, from the BC Center for Excellence in HIV and AIDS on examining the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on syndemic conditions and related effects on PrEP use among gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men in Vancouver. I'm excited to hear from you, Jordan. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, let me, oh, um, let me just put on my slideshow. Oh, all right. So um, as Carmen mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Jordan Sang and I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at the BC Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS. Um, and today I'll be talking about um, some of the work that I've been doing for my CTN postdoctoral fellowship. I'm looking at the impacts of COVID-19 on syndemics um, and specifically at PrEP interruptions among HIV negative unknown gay, bisexual and other men of sex with men in Canada. And my uh, co-authors are presented here. Um, so I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, so a bit of background, um, the secondary impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic um, may have lasting impacts, especially for those who are most affected. And um, I'm specifically interested in gay, bisexual, and other men of sex with men. Um, uh, for the reason that being that um, when the pandemic first started, um, there was a lot of closures of sexual health clinics um, here in BC and Vancouver. And these um, sexual health clinics are a primary uh, site for prevention and care for GBM. And there's growing attitudes that suggest that uh, the COVID-19 um, pandemic may be considered a syndemic, um, which disproportionately affects those who are already marginalized as opposed to a singular pandemic. And syndemic theory uh, conceptualizes how uh, multiple epidemics interact synergistically. Um, so, and this contributes to disease, disease proliferation. Um, so early on in the pandemic, um, preliminary data among gay, bisexual, and other men who sex with men found that about 
of uh, GBM in the study uh, reported um, stopping PrEP use uh, with the main reason being COVID-19. And additionally, 17% uh, reported stopping PrEP um, with the main reason indicating that it was difficulty to access PrEP um, during this time. So in terms of the research objectives for this study, um, so I wanted to look at the longitudinal impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and the different uh, waves of the pandemic and these implications on PrEP use among HIV negative unknown GBM in Vancouver. And so objective one, um, I wanted to assess trends of syndemic production and trends of PrEP interruptions among HIV negative unknown GBM in Vancouver. And then I wanted to look at um, syndemic correlates of PrEP interruptions among HIV negative unknown uh, GBM in Vancouver. So in terms of the methods, um, this uh, data comes from the ENGAGE study, um, which is, is, is a longitudinal biobehavioral cohort of GBM um, in Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal. <clears throat> and these uh, uh, participants were recruited using respondent-driven sampling from February 2017 to August 2019. Eligibility for the study was that individuals had to be 16 years of age or older, identify as a man, including trans men, live in Vancouver, Toronto, or Montreal, and report sex with another man in the past six months. They also had to be um, directly recruited into the study or be a seed participant. Um, however, um, while the ENGAGE study is a three-city study, this um, analysis in particular only uses data from Vancouver. And this is because our unique linkage with the BC HIV drug treatment program um, to assess uh, PrEP uptake and continuation directly, um, whereas um, there is no linkages um, that we have in Toronto or Montreal. And uh, uh, the reason for this being is that um, uh, BC is currently the only province uh, that offers publicly funded, uh, fully funded PrEP um, for individuals who are eligible. And so these analyses are from uh, March 2018 to April 2021. Um, however, uh, we note that um, uh, for our study sites, um, because of the pandemic, uh, they were closed from March 2020 to September 2020. So in terms of uh, the measures and the types of analysis that uh, we used, so we looked at syndemic conditions, and these um, included anxiety and depression, which were uh, both measured by the HAD scale. And so we dichotomized scores um, with scores of 11 or greater, indicating a moderate to severe scores, and 10 or less, uh, indicating normal to mild. And um, we also asked about any experiences of interpersonal violence, um, whether they be the victim or the perpetrator. And so this was measured any at baseline and measured um, in the past six months at follow-up visits. We also looked at uh, poly substance use. Um, and so this asked about two or more substances used in the past six months. And we also looked at alcohol use, um, which was measured by the audit C scale. And so scores were dichotomized four or more indicating hazardous alcohol use. Um, for prep interruptions, um, we uh, define this as um, for participants indicating that they stopped prep. So indicating to the healthcare provider that they stopped prep or um, participants um, didn't refill their prep refills for at least six months. In terms of our analyses, we use univariable generalized linear mix models um, to examine trends in synthetic conditions, as well as trends in PrEP interruptions. Um, we also applied three-level mixed effects logistic regressions with RDS clustering um, to examine the individual, as well as additive and interaction effects of syndemics on PrEP use among GBM who reported PrEP use prior to the study visit. So a bit of baseline sociodemographic results. Um, the median age of our participants in this analysis was 34 years old. About 46% of our sample here um, had an annual income less than $30,000, and about 48% uh, identified as Canadian ethnicity. Uh, moreover, um, the major majority of our sample, 85.5%, um, identified as gay, and 94.3% identified as cisgender. 73.4% um, were currently employed, and again, um, the majority of our participants, 84.5%, um, had a greater than high school education. So in terms of our trend results, um, so these are um, our findings for 766 participants reporting on 2,396 visits from March 2018 to April 2021. And what we found here is that depressive symptoms increased over our study period. <clears throat> 
um, with a sp uh, particular increase after the onset of um, COVID-19 in Canada um, when our study offices reopened. However, we also found decreasing trends of poly substance use, alcohol use, and interpersonal violence. Um, we did not find any trends for anxiety. So in terms of our PrEP interruption trends, um, we did find an increasing trend of um, PrEP interruptions over time. And I uh, include a table here um, for the percentages of interruptions at study visits. And we see here um, that uh, when the study began in March 2018, um, this was 1.2%. However, by the end of our um, study visits in April 2021, um, interruptions were about 30%, so 29.8%. So for our multivariable model, um, so this is uh, reporting on 828 visits from 280 HIV negative unknown uh, participants since March, 2018. And we used a generalized linear mix model um, to assess PrEP interruptions at study visits. And what we found here is that um, the time period was uh, significant in our analyses. So using the reference period of March, 2018 to March, 2020, um, we found that after our study offices reopened in September 2020, as well as for our follow-up in April 2021, um, this time period had increased odds of PrEP interruptions. Uh, additionally, we found that participants who scored uh, moderate to severe on the HADS um, depression scale, um, these individuals also had greater odds of uh, PrEP interruptions compared to individuals who sco scored normal to mild. Uh, we found that any experiences of IPV <clears throat> were associated with uh, lower odds of PrEP interruptions, um, as well as uh, individuals who had a current relationship with the main partner, um, they had greater odds of um, PrEP interruptions. And uh, additionally, what we looked at was um, PrEP eligibility at the study visit. So using um, the number of uh, factors and questions um, which individuals are eligible for PrEP in BC. And we found that individuals who met their PrEP eligibility at the study visits um, had lower odds of PrEP interruptions than individuals who didn't. And then lastly, individuals who were older also had uh, lower odds of PrEP interruptions as well. So in terms of conclusions, um, so in for our syndemic findings, uh, we did find that increasing trend of depressive symptoms. However, we also found decreasing trends of alcohol use polysubstance use, and IPV. Um, in our multivariable model, we found that depressive symptoms were associated with increased odds of PrEP interruptions, and that any experiences of IPV were associated with decreased odds of PrEP interruptions. We didn't find any other associations with other syndemic conditions, and we didn't find significant uh, interaction effects as well. Additionally, um, we did find an increasing trend of PrEP interruptions over time. So by the end of our study period, 30% of GBM had a PrEP interruption um, at their visit date. And time period was significant as well. So um, the time period after COVID, so September 2020 to April 2021, was associated with increased odds of PrEP interruptions. <coughs> and then um, what's really important to highlight here is that GBM who met clinical eligibility for PrEP at their study visits were less likely to report PrEP interruptions than GBM who did not meet eligibility at their study visits. So this implies that uh, GBM who are most at risk uh, and they met the eligibility for PrEP were less likely to interrupt their PrEP treatment. Um, some limitations that are study site closure from March 2020 to September 2020. Um, however, a big strength of the study is um, our linkages with the BC PrEP program in which we can directly measure PrEP continuation and these interruptions. And some takeaways from our findings is that um, future research should expand on our findings um, using qualitative research to further examine the impact of the pandemic on GBM. Um, as well as um, while these increasing PrEP interruptions are concerning, um, it seems that those most at risk are less likely to interrupt tr treatment. And then lastly, for our depression finding, um, perhaps additional mental health services and targeted follow-up assessments for PrEP continuation uh, may be needed to mitigate the effects of the pandemic on GPM. Um, we have references, and then lastly, acknowledgements, and um, any questions? <laughs>
I'm going to jump in with a question <laughs> um, because I know we're short on time. And I was, I kind of see this as a hopeful presentation. I was kind of excited to see that there was no, there's decreases in alcohol use, polysubstance use, IPV, and those most impacted um, were not experiencing a prep interruption. How do you explain these positive things? Yeah, and uh, I was surprised with these findings well. Um, I originally hypothesized that there would be increased in depression, anxiety, su um, substance use, um, just because of what I hypothesized the effects of the pandemic had on loneliness, isolation. Um, however, um, we didn't find these things. Um, and specifically what I wanted to highlight and what I think is most important is that while we did find increasing PrEP interruptions, um, those who met the eligibility criteria for PrEP um, were less likely to interrupt, which is a positive finding, meaning that those individuals who knew that they had higher risk for PrEP or for higher risk for HIV um, didn't interrupt their PrEP treatment, which is a great finding. Yeah, that is great. We, we have 18 seconds, but there was <laughs> one question around if we looked at only IPV victimization instead of both, maybe there'd be a different finding. That was the comment. Yeah. Um, there's definitely that option. We we didn't do that for this study, but um, perhaps uh, we can look in that in more sensitivity analyses and see if there is a difference. Thank you so much for your great responses. And you are all fantastic. Really wonderful session today. Um, thank you.